2016, the A&E Network was preparing to take on the Church of Scientology in a big way. What few people knew, however, was that the network was in a bit of a quandary. That summer, it had paid for two separate series that had been filmed and edited by different production companies and were both ready to air, each of them exposing Scientology in different ways. A&E decided to air the series that featured King of Queens actress Leah Remini and former Scientology spokesman Mike Rinder, and it was a decision that paid off immediately. Scientology in the Aftermath was a huge hit right from its first episode, the biggest A&E premiere in more than two years. The show would go on to have three full seasons and won two very deserved Emmy Awards. Scientology watching would never be the same. Leah Remini's show permanently changed the way Scientology is perceived and covered by the press. The other show, however, was a different story. Produced by a company called Sirens Media, the series was fully filmed, edited, and ready to air, and it told the stories of a number of people who were not featured in the Aftermath series. We have always been curious about this show and the person who was meant to be its presenter and star. So in this new series, we're going to talk to some of the people who were involved in it. Today, we're talking to Phil Jones about how the Sirens Media series tried to help him find his two children, the two kids in the Sea Org that Scientology prevents him from contacting. So Phil, uh, I, I'm really interested to find out how this whole thing went down with you. Can you start at the beginning and tell me how they approached you and how you found out that this TV series was being put together? Well, we were living in Vegas at the time. We had moved out there after Florida kind of uh, ended for us somewhat. Um, and we wanted to be close to where the kids were in L.A., but, you know, not in L.A. So And work was better for us in Vegas anyway. So we had gone into... Uh, Los Angeles a number of times to see if we could contact the kids. We went to Celebrity Center. We called uh, Author Services. Uh, you know, we were at Celebrity Center a number of times and uh, asked to go in. Could They wouldn't allow us. Uh, we parked in the parking lot across the street uh, at the supermarket uh, across the, the corner, Katie Corner, from them. And then they would send security people out and basically surround us. And then I'd looked in the rear view mirror and there was some uh, security girl from CC take pictures of our license plates. And so we were, we were hoping to see Michael come across the road from Celebrity Center to where he lived, but we just realized that was not going to happen. So we were back in Vegas and uh, I guess the show had contacted Karen De La Carriere and she had referred them to us because we were staying with them when we went to L.A. Uh, they were kind enough to put us up at the time. And so they referred the, the show to us. They contacted us and asked to do a Skype interview, uh, sort of a pre, you know, like a, uh, I don't know, a screening interview kind of thing. Sure. And so uh, we did that with a, a very pleasant girl named Hillary. Um but we were right in the middle of our Scientology, ex-Scientology super paranoia. I've seen this with some others that get out where, you know, you kind of get really paranoid about what Scientology might do to you if you're criticizing or you're speaking up. And uh, since we had been going down to L.A. a bit, I was really nervous about the fact that maybe this wasn't a TV show. Maybe it was just somebody trying to find out what we were doing uh, right, and right. as far as trying to see the kids. Um, and in fact, I got the girl's name that did the interview and I searched on online, found out she lived in St. Pete. And I thought, oh, no, she's a Scientologist for sure. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> she lives near Flag. And oh, man, I tell you, it was everything was going through my head. Uh, eventually, though, I settled down and, and we went through the interview uh, and we heard a little while later that they they wanted to take us on and do the show with us. So they sent us this big, long contract. Uh, it was pretty uh, uh, 
much on their side, like the contract. It was, it was non-disclosures, stuff like that. I just figured, what the heck, you know, we signed it and sent it back. And then, uh, and then they set up the first filming, which was a little while later. Uh, I can't remember how long. Uh, it might have been a month later. Um, and they wanted to come and shoot uh, interviews in our apartment. And I was still in my paranoia stage. So I didn't want them to know where we lived. So I said, no, not at our apartment. So they rented a, uh, a room in a motel just off the Vegas Strip. And we met them there. Um, and I, I was, I, I went in this room and I, I, they must have thought we were so crazy because I was looking in drawers, seeing if somebody had, <laughs> had drugs there. Right. I was looking for microphone hidden. I, I was just like, they, they, they see, anyway, then, then, uh, Jamie DeWolf showed up and then I was fine. I, cause I knew that he was a critic and that there was no way he was going to be part of this if, you know, if it was anything OSA related. So uh, we did our first interview there. Uh, and so Jamie was involved in the interview or he's just watching? Um, uh, he was, no, just watching. He, I don't recall him asking any of the questions. Most of the questions came from one of the producers and some from one of the other producers. I think it was our first interview and I really, I, it, I don't remember a whole lot about it. You know, we just sat, they asked us to go over our, our story and how we came to where we were and stuff like that. So, And some of those basics, uh, some of the people listening may not know, you had two children who are in the Sea Org and right. you left Scientology some years ago, but because of that, your kids have disconnected from you in the Scientology way. Right. And so you, you'd like to see them again, Mike and Emily, Right. Right. And that's why we went to L.A. to see if we could see the kids. Um, you know, we called numerous times to Author Services, where our daughter is was working. And we went to Celebrity Center, which is where our son was working. Uh, we just could not make any progress seeing them at all. And uh, the inter- what I found interesting about this show, uh, from what I've heard, I, I, I was only involved very tangentially. They asked my advice about you know who to approach and that kind of thing and i suggested some some people that's the extent of my involvement but i guess after they had that initial interview what's kind of unusual and different than other shows that have been done is then they tried to come up with a way to have some sort of action right some sort of thing happen right uh, involving you how, how did that develop in your segment well the the, the whole thing was sort of more set up like they wanted to document what we were doing okay they were they weren't suggesting what to do they weren't they wanted to basically just follow us in our journey to see if we could see the kids so um you know we started to come up with ideas uh it wasn't them coming up with ideas we i mean we had some crazy ideas i thought of an idea of getting a starbucks coffee cup empty coffee cup because I knew our son liked co- co- coffee, Starbucks coffee. And I thought, well, we'll sneak a, a, a burner phone in the cup to him somehow in Celebrity Center and so I can call him. Um, I mean, it was just some, we never did that one, but it was just some of these ideas we sort of came up with uh, trying to figure out what to do to contact the kids. Um, so and we started to come up with some different ideas. One of them we came up with was to put a missing poster uh, around Celebrity Center with a picture of our son on it. We hadn't seen him for several years and never heard from him. In our world, he was missing. And the last we had heard, he was in Scientology Celebrity Center and had basically disappeared from our lives. So we had a whole bunch of these things printed up and we went down to Celebrity Center cameras in tow we were wired for sound and we just walked around and handed these flyers out posted them on uh, lamp posts uh, and just walked all around and as soon as we'd put them up uh, Scientology would have someone out there taking them down but a lot of people that were the restaurants across the road uh, on uh, 
just across oh, Franklin. Franklin. Yeah. Um, there were some nice little restaurants there, and all the people there that we approached were very uh, 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 sympathetic about what we were doing. And, you know, took posters. One person took a poster and apparently, I guess, posted it in their laundry room in their apartment. Somebody else saw it, posted that on Instagram, and it went kind of viral a little bit. So we got some motion out of these missing posters. And uh, when we got back to Vegas after that, we got a letter from one of Scientology's big time lawyers, Bert Dexler, uh, cease and desist. You know, stop what you're doing. You can't be doing this and yada, yada, yada. And, um, you know, we they were pretty uh, intent on having us stop doing anything we were doing. And I think they also sent one to Karen at that point, didn't they? They, they did. They, they sent a similar letter to her. And I didn't uh, mention my letter out there because at the time we were doing the show, we were under non-disclosure. So... Uh, but Karen wasn't, so I think that at the time uh, she had uh, sent a copy so that you could post it onto the bunker, which I thought was good, at least that way. Uh, it was almost identical letter that she had gotten because they assumed that she was involved with the show. All she had done on the thing was just somebody had asked her on the show, hey, do you know anybody? And she said, Phil and Willie Jones, and that was the end of her involvement. So, but you know, they just sent her this letter anyway um, to, to cease and desist. But from our viewpoint, we weren't going to be heading back to L.A. for several weeks. I, I just I got this letter. I said, Willie, we're going. And we hopped in the car. We went back and just started doing more protesting. I, I wasn't going to let them shut us down. In fact, it made me more determined than ever. So what else went into your episode? Um, well, we did... Um, uh, we went and did a, uh, a welfare check as well um, to see if our son Mike was okay. We went to the LAPD uh, again with cameras in tow. They wouldn't let the cameras in the uh, station, but one of the producers came in with us and also Jamie DeWolf came in with us and we spoke to the uh, officer at the desk um, and he said that he'd have a couple of officers meet us at Celebrity Center. So we went back there and we met the two officers and they spoke to uh, the security guys and they came back to us and said, oh no, they said he's okay. So I said, well, no, did you talk to him? So they tried phoning and they said, we talked to him on the phone. I said, well, how do you know it was him? Yeah. And I said, I want you to get eyes on. So they went back and then they came back and they said, well, they've told us he's not even in the building. And they got an address from them and they said, well, wait here, we'll go and and speak to him where he is. So they went and then one of the police officers called me about 20 minutes later and said, Scientology gave us a fake address and they were pissed. Oh boy, they were, oh, wow. they were not happy that Scientology had sort of just led them on a wild goose chase. So they started tracking our son down. I don't know how they did it, but they, oh, they asked me a few questions like, what's his wife's name they found out somehow that michael's wife's father was in the hospital they went to the hospital and our son mike was there oh uh, i can't do that sorry right. i know it's hard you know funny thing is from being in Scientology for 40 years and TRs all those years, you kind of learn to suppress emotion. And I can't remember ever crying in all those years. When I talk about the kids, I'm a basket case. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's the only thing I really still to this day uh, ever cry about. But uh, anyway, um, so I they did get Michael to call me, but it didn't go well. So we uh we ended up you know just i i said at that point i said i'm giving up i'm done and you know i think the the film crew was kind of like going uh oh at that point um you know I, we started walking back to the car i said i'm done and i you know as we were walking by the main door at celebrity center i looked over and i see one of the security guys laughing 
and I got so mad. I got, I just, I said, you laugh, you laugh because families get broken up by Scientology that, that, you know, anyway, I got so mad. I said, I looked at him and I said, we're going to be back and we're going to be back bigger. And, and, you know, so we left and, and after that we came up with the billboard idea um, and started posting a billboard up uh, with our call me message. And was it, so was that while the show was still being produced, put together? Uh, the billboard, yes. We, um, uh, a few people had mentioned the, the idea of doing a billboard. Um, and so it, it was kind of developed sort of out of the, the missing poster thing, something bigger. So um, there was a, a, someone, a, a friend who referred us to a, a, a graphic artist who posts on the bunker under R2. I don't know if I can mention his name here. He's been outed pretty much by Scientology, but uh, he's an excellent, amazing graphic artist. And he designed the billboard. <clears throat> um, and then we approached uh, one of the billboard companies. I think Outfront Media was the first one we went to. And we tried to raise money for it because they're not cheap. They're about four or $5,000 a month to run a billboard in L.A. And we had we were like we maybe raised seventy dollars and weren't getting anywhere. And then you were kind enough to mention it on the bunker, and everyone just started chipping in. And within days, we had enough for the billboard. I think even for two months. Oh wow! So it was just an amazing amount of support. Um, so we had it, everything. We had the artwork done. We sent it down. They they had it all printed up, ready to go. We looked at the site where it was going to go up. And I think it was the day before they contacted us and said, nope, sorry, we canceled it. And, you know, obviously we knew what happened. The Scientology got to them uh, right. and had them cancel it. So then we spoke to another company called Regency. I think that uh -huh. was the next one we spoke to. Uh, and the billboard that we were going to get was literally half a block. You could see David Miscavige's residence which is right behind author services right. from where that billboard was. So we were really excited. Same thing, artwork done, the the printing was done, the thing was ready to go up day before. Sorry, we had to cancel. And apparently, because I, I had spoken to the, the one of the girls in the office there, and she said that Scientology had offered to, or their, I guess their media uh, contact or whoever they had for the media contact had contact them like basically offering to buy up all of their empty billboard space uh, it had to have been millions of dollars I don't know if they did do that but somehow or other Regency canceled on us so we went to the third one which was Lamar media and I told him what had happened and he said we will not back down on this for you we'll do this so we we got a billboard up in uh, near the uh, the stadium there uh, in uh, uh, it's not too far from Dodger Stadium that's right yeah yeah um, I can't remember the name of the street but and and we anyway we announced that we were going to go there uh, for the op the gr kind of a grand opening when the billboard was going up and we thought maybe we'd get a few people out we arrived there and there was all this press. There was uh, Inside Edition. There was Good Morning America, Today Show, um, uh, an entire scrum of media. That uh, and we ended up actually going on Good Morning America and Today Show with our story. And uh, um, uh, so it it kind of the, the the whole thing got out there quite a bit. Well, I rem I will tell you, I I had some readers angry at me at the time because. You know, you were kind enough to uh, keep me involved in what was going on so that I knew day by day what you were going through. And I was reporting as it was happening, these companies turning you down. And I had some readers angry with me saying, Tony, you're letting Scientology know what's going on and they're getting to it. But I was like, yeah, but this is what, you know, we need to make some noise about this kind of thing. People need right. to know what's going on and I'm glad we did because clearly the press was paying attention to what was going on and I'm glad they were there for you. Oh yeah, it would not have gone the way it, it had had we not 
done it the way we did. Because um, with you putting the story out like that, that's how we ended up with all that press there. Um, you know, the, the, the people who are following the story and the number of times we got turned down, that is why we ended up getting, and after that, we were still getting press after that. We had BBC all through South America and Spanish. We had we had interview. I had radio interviews, and in we were on live TV in Australia. They set up a studio in Vegas, where we went down there, and we were on live morning show in yep. Australia. Yeah, it was huge, and it would not have been like that had we not done it the way we did it. And I know that I do understand that some people were getting upset at it because there was a chance in the end we may not have gotten the billboard up, but we wouldn't have given up. We would have somehow yeah. gotten the billboard up. Um, you know, so were the were the sirens media people? Um, were they going to put this in the episode? The whole thing with yes, the billboard? Yeah, we, they were. They filmed all the whole thing as we were doing this. They were involved. Uh, well, not involved. I mean, they were they were documenting it. It was right. it was all run as a documentary. Yeah. Um, where they were basically following us around and and filming our story as we were doing this stuff, <clears throat> and. Um, including when we went to author services we had gone there um with the camera crew because we were going to try to get a letter that willie wrote to our daughter emily um so we were down there and the first thing that they did was call the police and the police arrived um and the police you know we said, told them why were they he says you guys have every right to be here and they didn't do anything to us they just they hung around just i guess to keep an eye out but they they told us straight up they said you have every right to be here um but we knocked on the front door and i could see their security guy that was in the front door ducked behind a, they had one of these bushes like these indoor uh, plants and he ducks behind it to hide and I'm, we were just laughing because it was just so bizarre that the security guy was just hiding behind a bush inside the front door um, so we walked around the side of the building and i looked down the street and a car had pulled up and one of the executives at uh, author services who i knew because uh, I had met him when we'd gone there some time earlier and some years prior to meet em with Emily, a, a guy named Marcus, who was um, one of the top executives there. And I ran over to him and I, and I surprised the camera operators because they were trying to keep up with me holding these huge cameras. Um, anyway, I ran up to Marcus and I, I said, Marcus, can you give this letter to Emily? And I think he was shocked. He sees the cameras, he sees the police, and he said, yeah, I'll give it to her. And then he went in the door. And I know 100% he did not give it to her, but he, I guess at the time he kind of agreed to, but um, I'm almost certain that Emily would not have gotten that letter. And let me just, uh, to help some of the folks that aren't familiar with it, uh, Scientology has many different subsidiaries, many different entities. And there was a reorganization in the early 1980s that created a lot of different places. And one of them was this Author Services, Inc., ASI, which was intended to be L. Ron Hubbard's literary agent and literary agency and would put out his, not, not the Scientology side, but his fiction, that kind of thing. And um, it's, it's one of the few... Uh, it's, it's really important in the world of Scientology. It doesn't run the other parts of Scientology, but it's always been considered one of the most important parts of Scientology. And some of the Sea Org members who work there have a little more freedom, uh, including your daughter, Emily, yeah. because she and her husband, John Goodwin, um, run this uh, part of ASI called Galaxy Press, which is they split that off from the publisher that was publishing Scientology books just to focus on Hubbard's fiction. They want to keep all of this terrible 1930s Pump, you know, uh, pulp fiction that L. Ron Hubbard wrote in print, even though it, it makes no sense and most people don't want to read it. To them, it's a you know, it's part of Scientology is to keep everything he wrote in print. So in order to do that, they put out these nice editions of his fiction, and then they go to shows, they go to Comic Con, they go to all these different trade shows, and so John and Emily have to dress up nicer than other Sea Org members. They have to present themselves in places. 
it's kind of a different role that your daughter has. It's really kind yeah, of interesting she's, because she's she's at Comic Con in San Diego right now as we speak. Yeah, and she's she's uh, so it's interesting because and because of that, so Mike is associated with the Celebrity Center and we never see him. Right. But Emily, because she's with Author Services and Galaxy Press. We see her pictures of her when they do their uh, contest every year, um, the Writers of the Future contest in the spring. We see her at trade shows. Uh, it's kind of heartbreaking, though, because you know, I, we see her and we know that she's not allowed to contact you or that kind of thing. Right. So this is what I just want people to understand. So there's, they have this, this headquarters, ASI, on Hollywood Boulevard there. And in the past... I'm told it's no longer the case. But in the past, David Miscavige himself had an apartment that was basically kind of attached to it behind. Right. And that was where he tended to live when he was in L.A. I'm told they don't have that apartment anymore. I don't know why. And he's living in Florida now anyway. But at that time, uh, who knows? He might have been around when you were doing all that. Yeah, I mean, they, they came down pretty fast on that uh, Regency billboard once we uh, announced it. But... Uh... Um, but we, you know, we managed to get one up and we had good success with it. And then, uh, we did the ASI thing and then, uh, and then we managed to get another billboard in, uh, Florida near right. the bank. Right. And, uh, what, what Sirens Media was going to do, this whole, whole show was being done for, uh, A&E. Um, they were the ones, I guess, contracting Sirens Media, which was the production company to, put the show together and what they were going to do uh, sirens media was going to get all the other like i think there were eight shows eight participants um that were in the show different shows different episodes and they were going to get them all together for kind of a final uh thing where they were going to film in florida while we were there uh, doing that last billboard uh, so we we were still living in Vegas and we were planning to go to Florida and I thought about flying and I know that Scientology tracks um, where, you know, X's go and stuff because they can track uh, who books on airline flights. And one of the uh, executive producers had all, I think, I, I think at that time had been uh, ambushed at an airport by Scientology. So they knew. Oh, wow the deal uh with scientology uh yeah it was all in fact i think he apparently he filmed it all i mean, whether it was with a cell phone or not but uh so we drove we drove out there and from las vegas to clearwater from las vegas to clearwater i said wow well, we're gonna go and drive it so we got in the car and we uh, and we drove out there and we arrived uh stayed in a, a hotel and we still had a <clears throat> we had a mailbox in uh, Dunedin that we had had for years, so we stopped by there to pick up whatever mail we might have. Usually we'd have it forwarded to our Vegas address, but we figured we'd just pick it up. And so we started driving uh, from Dunedin, where we we're going to go over to Tampa to meet the film crew, <clears throat> and we we're going down. One of the roads uh, from Dunedin down through Clearwater is called McMullen Booth. And there was this car that was just right behind us. Like we, I could see this car, and I, I thought, well, these guys are following us. So we, we turned this way, we turned that. They were right behind us all the time. I said, wow. okay, these are Scientology PIs that have been hired to follow us because they knew we were doing the show. They picked us up at the mailbox. They must have had someone planted there watching to see if we would arrive. But we used to live right at McMullen Booth and Main Street, Dunedin. And I said, I know the area. I can lose these guys. So I turned down Main Street. And there was a cut off, a cut across street that would cut across back to McMullen Booth. So I, I pulled into the turn lane and I waited for a line of cars that was coming towards. And I gradually turned just in front of it, just leaving no room for this car to turn. Yeah. You zip back over to McMullen Booth, zip down the road and turn off to a side street. And we just sat there and waited for 20 minutes or so, and they never found us again. So then we just drove over to Tampa and met up with the film crew um, without the PIs following us. 
Um, and we did a bunch of filming around. We went, there was a park we'd gone to and where we all kind of got together. They did some filming, some interviews, some different things like that. And then uh, from there, we all uh, went to Flag to do some protesting, to walk around the new Flag building. Uh, again, cameras in tow. And this, I think, was the last thing we were going to be doing. <clears throat> this was sort of the finale part of it. So we walked around, and, you know, of course, Osa was out there and, you know, hassling a few of the people and whatever. But uh, um, So when we finished, um, we were going to go and see our grandkids, which uh, meet them at a park for a picnic down in uh, just a little south of there. And you have you have three children, so this is these are the children of your the son who's not in Scientology. Right, right. right. So and we have two. We have a couple of grandkids that live in Florida. They're grown now. They have their own. Uh, one of them have the. We have three great grandkids now, yeah. um, but we were going to go and meet up with them, and so we started driving away. And one of the producers called me on my cell phone and said, one of the uh, Scientology PIs was following us uh, as we pulled out. And now Sirens had hired a couple of private investigators as kind of like security for the whole show and for us and whatever. And apparently they knew this guy who was the head of the company of the private investigation company that Scientology had hired. And I, I, I wondered sometimes if he had started following us because I had lost one of his employees, he said, oh, I'll show you how it's done, right? Right. So um, anyway, so yeah, we saw him following us and and I didn't want to take him to where the grandkids were. So I said to Willie, I said, oh, I just need to lose this guy. So I, I, we were going down South Fort Harrison, just south of the, uh, uh, the Scientology Fort Harrison Hotel. And I pulled into a side street and it's pulled over to the side of the road. He was in a big pickup truck. He came screaming around the corner right past us and down the street a little bit, and he stopped. And I looked at his, the size of his truck, and I go, you know, that guy's not going to be able to turn around very fast. <laughs> the street was narrow. I did a quick U-turn back onto Fort Harrison, turned down the street. I could see in my rear view mirror him trying to do a three-point turn. <laughs> and, I, but, and I went onto Fort Harrison. I turned into a side street, turned behind a building, and we stopped and we looked and we saw him screaming down Fort Harrison and a few minutes later screaming back up, screaming back down. And we waited maybe 20 minutes or so. We didn't see him anymore. Uh, called one of the uh, PI security guys for the from Sirens and then they came over and kind of ex uh, escorted us uh, down to where we were going. Would this happen? Would this happen to be Dwayne Powell? Do you know the guy that was following uh, you? I, you know what that name sounds familiar from. I don't know for sure. Uh, I mean, I could describe the guy's truck, but I don't know the name of the guy. Because um, in well, that in that period, yeah, he was kind of the go-to guy for a while, particularly in Florida. So you it know, might I, have been. You know, one of the PIs named Sean. I think I think he mentioned that name. And that might have been who the guy was. He must have been pissed that I lost him. Because yeah, sure. Because he's got to go tell his guys that, well, sorry, this guy lost me too. So, but I knew the area like the back of my hand. We'd lived there for 25 years. And, uh, you know, I uh, I knew all the shortcuts and everything. So So was that the conclusion of filming for you? Um, pretty much. We, we did a few other little things. We actually had a... a, a we did one other billboard near their media productions, and I think one, they sent down one of the producers that lived in L.A. down to film a little bit, and um, uh, and I think I can't remember if they sent anyone for when we protested at the opening of the Scientology media productions. I don't think they did, no. Okay. So I think the, that was pretty much really the last filming it was the one at Flag. That was kind of their wrap-up finale where everybody was together um, but um, yeah we we made a we made some noise and you know we had an impact and I, I like to think that we brought the whole subject of Scientology disconnection to uh, uh, you know a little bit more 
you know, in, in the forefront, um, you know, a lot of the abuses that Scientology has been uh, participating in and doing on other people, disconnection, uh, you know, we wanted to really make sure that, that people knew that a large part of what Scientology does is break up families. So No, you, you certainly brought more attention to that issue because of the billboards in the, in the media you received. Um, what, so... Did you then? This I think what this would have been like late 2015, right? Yeah, actually a little bit later. I think it was 2016. I think by the time we were, um, I, I think when we were on the Good Morning Good Morning America it was too early 2016. I think. Okay. I'm not great with with dates, but I think we were into 2016 by then. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, and then so did you ever? Did they talk to you about how your episode was going to go? Did did you get any kind of? Did you get to see any? No, of it? I never saw any of it. We were we got a we got I think we got a, a release date of I don't know end of February and then they changed it to March and then it was two months later and later and later and it just kept putting back. It kept they kept putting it back and back, uh, and we never got any reason for it. We were never told anything. And I would try to get in touch with them and go, you know, what's going on? Oh well, we don't know an A and E and da 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 da. da. But by that time, after, I don't know, maybe three to six months later, um, Leah Remini's show was coming out. Uh, and hers was uh, going to be on A&E. So when I saw that, I kind of thought, well, you know, at that point, she's a celebrity. They're probably going to lean into that a little bit more than ours. And probably at that point, ours got put on the shelf. I don't know for what reason or whether that was the reason. But um, but I kind of saw the writing on the wall that at that point that we probably were not going to get aired. Uh, and it was tough because we put for over a year, we were heart and soul into this. It was hugely emotional for both Willie and I, um, you know, just all the uh, stuff we went through to do it. It was it was tough. Uh, and then the disappointment of them not airing the show in the end, uh, that was a enormous letdown. I don't, I don't think it's that unusual for a network to order up a couple similar shows and then only use one of them. And, um, and, and then of course that Leah's show was incredibly successful for them. Oh yeah, and for and for us too, it was successful in that in that it really brought to the forefront the, the abuses of Scientology. Uh, I mean, we're thrilled that she did it because it it really made an impact, and I, I don't know, maybe bigger than ours would have done. So uh, yeah, shows you know, and networks they own the they own the show, so they can do with it what they want. And if they right, and that was the only thing I was curious about at the time because I thought, okay. You know, they had a celebrity. She's very, not only was she well known, she was great at what she was doing. The show was a huge success. But the, what I was always wondering at that time was, you know, I, I hope they sell the Siren show to somebody else because it, your show sounds like it was so different because it was, they focused so much on this sort of like dramatic scenes and, right. and action. Uh, oh, yeah. There was, uh, yeah, there was definitely some other stuff too that, you know, the, uh, you know, some of the times we went down to confront uh, Scientology at, you know, at Celebrity Center, there were, there were some pretty intense times in there and some dramatic scenes. Um, and um, yeah, it was on the ground stuff. It wasn't just the interviews. Most of it was on the ground stuff. Um, and we were hoping, I think, from what I understand, they did try to sell it to some other, uh, I think they even tried to maybe sell it to Amazon. Um, but I, I don't know, you know, it could be that the, the Scientology aspect of it may have shied people away from buying it, you know, not wanting to get sued or whatever. And have, have the producers ever gotten back to you in later years and just said anything about what happened? No. Never ever heard nothing, anything about it at all. Um, and then I guess uh, a year or two ago, we wrote them and said, "Look, can you release us from our uh, our uh, you know our non-disclosure uh, 
things so that we could, and even the non-compete, and they said, yeah, no problem. So, you know, we were free to speak out, even though we were speaking out anyway. Um, but we were more free to at least discuss the show, like like this, the podcast, like with you were doing. We're, we're free to discuss it now, the show and, and the details of it, because we were released from our uh, non-disclosure. And what was your understanding of what Jamie DeWolf's role in the show was going to be? Well, uh, he was sort of the central... Uh, common point throughout it that he was um uh, that's a tough one i i I don't i you know we were so involved with our own part of it that uh that uh i don't know how they were putting that part of it together i don't have i have no idea how they edited the thing up i've never seen the show so i don't know it could have been i i assume it was pretty good because the people who were running it uh, they seem very competent. The production company, uh, uh, when the guys that were filming, the producers, the executive producer, they were all very competent people. And I assume that they put together a really good show. But I, I have no idea how they incorporated uh, all of the stuff with Jamie into it. Because I'm, I'm just imagining like an MC or something. I, I don't know. I, it sounded like he was going to be kind of sort of a star of the show. I think so to a degree. I mean, he was uh, he was there through all the stuff. Like when we did our first billboard launch, I've got pictures of all of us in the media scrum there, and Jamie DeWolf right there, you know, uh, in the circle. So with us, so um, you know, he was definitely part of it through the whole thing. And uh, looking back now, um, what are the things that you're glad? that you experienced in the production and what are the things that, you know, are there any regrets or things that you wish had gone differently? Well, as difficult as it was um, emotionally and the disappointment of it not airing, we were able to um, make some noise. We got international press. We were literally all over the world in many languages. Um, You know, uh, so so we did get the word out and even though we didn't get to see our kids um i hope that we stopped some people or or helped give enough knowledge out there for some people to not get into scientology because knowing what scientology does and i i mean i did get some feedback there were a couple of people that did write me saying that you know i actually had a few people say they got out uh when they when they saw the billboards so you know, we, I think we made it, had an effect out there, no matter how difficult it was to do. Um, the other thing, too, is when you protest around Scientology, it's always a bit of a danger in what they're going to do to fight back against you. And, you know, it's always good to have cameras running. And even if you're not with a TV crew, you should have a camera running. But I, I always felt a little more confident having an entire film crew, along with the fact that I was wired for sound and everything with a microphone and you know, those microphone packs strapped to my back and you know so it 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 made us i think it made me a little more confident to get out there and and do these things uh on the ground yeah and uh my limited involvement in it again i was they asked me to help them find some people i think i, I helped find a couple of people for their episodes but i also had some um people tell me no and I, one person had been somebody who had suffered disconnection and had been kind of public about it. And so I went to them thinking, this is a great story. They have a great story to tell. And they surprised me and said, you know what? I, I'm being quiet now because I'm hoping that might give me a chance to see this loved one. Right. And <clears throat> I wanted to bring that up because um, this is so different for every person. You you guys decided to make noise. You guys decided to be visible as possible. Well, we we, we did, but we we didn't. We didn't. Uh, it it wasn't entirely our choice. We were under the radar for a couple of years before okay. we actually like because we knew that if we spoke out that we would not be able to see the kids. But um, we had kind of and we in our heads we are not in scientology anymore we were we were out but we had to pretend to be in um 
So this went on for a couple of years and, you know, we'd odd time go to an event or something, but for the most part, we sort of backed off even from that and we moved a little bit farther away from flag. So it was a little more difficult for people to show up at our door. Um, but, you know, I, you know, it was, I guess it was noticed that we were not participating as much. And my sister, who is a Scientologist, she's OT8, the highest you can go in Scientology. Um, she lives in Canada. We were in Florida at the time. She flew down to confront us on this. But, you know, she didn't tell us that that's what she was there for. It was just sort of, oh, well, we should get together. I'll come down to where you are. I said, oh, no, it's so far, you know. Uh, and we're busy, so maybe next week. And anyway, she kept pushing and pushing. So I, I finally I said to Willie, I said, well, you know, we're not going to be those people who don't go and socialize with our own family. Let's go and see her. And if it goes bad, we'll just walk away. So we met her at the Starbucks down in uh, the downtown Clearwater and you know it started off oh yeah and how's your son <laughs> and, you know, and but literally within five minutes she was saying well you know you you need to disconnect from this person on Facebook and I said well look let's not get into that let's you know I kept steering it away and 30 seconds later it'd be no but and there's this other this family that you're connected to their son left and they now left and I said look we've known them for 25 years I, I, you can't tell me who I can be friends with or not friends with. Uh, anyway, she kept pushing it, pushing it. I said, look, let's not talk about it here. Let's go outside and, you know, not in the restaurant. So we were walking outside and down the street. And I said, turned to Willie and I said, this is not going to go well. <laughs> so I said to my sister, I said, look, we're just going to go. We got to go home. And then my sister started laying into us like, oh, okay, no, you either go into flag now and you know, just come clean and get to get cleaned up or you're going to lose your family, meaning are the kids. And I, I so I t said to her, I said, if, if you do that, that's on you. I said, you know, you don't need to do that. Go and tell, you know, say that we're not doing anything wrong. We're not speaking out. We're not doing anything. So we left and we got in the car and within 24 hours, everybody was disconnecting from us literally everybody we knew because we lived in the scientology community around flag our world was scientology uh, business friends relatives all went overnight pretty much i ran into a, a guy i knew downtown clearwater i was going for a coffee he's crossing the road he sees me ducks behind a tree <laughs> he says oh no <laughs> runs behind a tree um, another guy I was on the phone with, an OT8 guy, um, as soon as he found out that, you know, we had, were disconnected, he, it, it, this was so funny, I couldn't believe it. Here's an OT8, he couldn't hang up his phone. He, he said, I'm trying to hang up on you. Phil, you're going to have to hang up for me. <laughs> <laughs> and here's an OT8 who couldn't hang up his phone oh, wow. and get off fast enough because he found out I was declared SP. When you're, so, and this is this all happened before the show, right? That you yeah, were telling me now. Before the show, that's why we ended up moving out to Vegas because there was nothing left. I, I went to a guy I had worked for for years uh, about doing some work for. Him. I literally made millions for this guy at one point, and uh, and he told me straight up. He said, "You can't work for me if you're not in good standing with the church." Wow. And so at that point, there was really nothing for us in Florida. So we went out to Vegas, and I had an old friend there that I knew, non-Scientologist, and he offered me some work. So, and Willie is a floral designer, so she got work at one of the chapels uh, in Vegas, and uh, we ended up, we went back and forth a little bit the first couple of years. We tried to kind of make it back into Florida, and sort of, but it, it just didn't fly, and in the end, uh, I think it was around 2015, we ended up back in Vegas for for the next three, four years or so. When your sister approached you that way, do you yeah. think she would have been under some pressure from Scientology to do that? Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. Well, she was on OT8, and they, they she's supposed to be doing stuff to... Uh, and she was actually monitoring uh, our Facebook page and our friends list. And I had at one point uh, made my friends list private. So when she was speaking to me and saying I need to disconnect from so-and-so, I thought, well, how do you know that they're on my friends list? 
she had obviously she'd recorded my friends list because I had unfriended that person previously because um, uh, there was some pressure early and I at, at first I was unfriending a few people just to kind of so we could stay under the radar but after a while I got fed up of being told who to keep unfriending people <clears throat> so but oh yeah she was definitely under pressure she was um, <clears throat> she was at flag to handle us that's what she was there for well, and I, the reason I brought that up before about uh, the person who was had decided to go quiet is I, I just wanted to say that I think everyone has to figure out their own path. And I have known people that have tried, you know, different ways. I talked to a mother, for example, who decided to be as loud as she could. She told me, she said that she, she made herself such a headache for the Church of Scientology that finally they just said, "Here's your son. Take him." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and so I think that 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 sort of aggressive, noisy uh, approach can work in some cases. It and, depends on the person that's in. I think that the, yeah. with Emily and possibly with Michael, especially with Emily, was on David Miscavige's personal staff for like ten years. Um, she knew everything, uh, and they're not going to let her go easily because. Um, she just knows too much. And so they're not going to kick her out and say, oh, your dad's making too much noise. They're, they're, they're going to tighten things down even more. Uh, well, her. I was told something recently, and I, I, I hadn't even checked with you before. I'm going to spring it on you here. Um, I, I am talking to somebody else who told me that Emily was actually working with Tom Cruise at one point. She was. No, she told me that once. She was at his Telluride play. She ride, rode his, his snowmobiles. Uh, I think she flew in his plane. Um, no, she she was uh, kind of working for Miscavige, but sort of working on his staff a little bit, too, uh, at the time, I think. Um, so. Yeah, I was told there was some funny incident where she was supposed to be traveling with crews and they had landed somewhere and she didn't have her passport with her. Yeah, and it caused, it caused kind of an, uh, an incident. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I never heard that, but uh, I suppose it's possible. Uh, you know, they hold onto their passports and maybe I, I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't her fault because probably Osa had her passport and just didn't give it to her when she right. was to travel. They, 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 well, all Scientologists that are in the Sea Org, the Scientologists in the Sea Org don't get to keep their passports. Uh, they had to turn their passports in and Scientology. Right. Them. So I would probably think Emily's not, she's too bright to, to sure. not take her passport like that. So the show has, nothing's happened to it. It hasn't been sold to another network. Um, what, what are you, what can you do now about Mike and Emily? I mean, can you tell me anything about, uh, for the public about what might be happening? Um, you know, with Michael, we don't hear anything. Um, like you said before, Emily is a little bit more public. She does PR events like, you know, the, the Chris Hollywood parade and stuff like that. They have a kind of a green room thing there and stuff like that. But, Michael, we don't hear anything about. Um, and with Emily, um, I, I, you know, uh, you know, from what we see, um, I, I know that there have been a few events that Emily has been at that we've had people go swing by. And I have one friend who uh, is actually a, a psychiatric nurse, and she just watched Emily and said, you know, how her husband just never lets her more than, you know, three feet from her. Emily looked very uh, controlled and, and not happy. And I, I just don't think she's happy where she is. I really don't. Um, I think that she's kind of uh, just doesn't know what to do or where to go. And, and now she, they, they married her off to this guy who's almost my age. And I, I, I don't know what to think about that. I really don't. Um, um, you know, it's kind of a strange situation. Uh, I ran into him once when we were protesting the 
re-release of Battlefield Earth down at Author Services, he somehow he stepped out onto the sidewalk and, and I started talking to him and said, hey, tell Emily that her parents love her. And, you know, he just turned around and walked away. Didn't say yeah. But, uh... gosh. Well, you know, it's just been heartbreaking to see what you and the other parents have gone through. Um, I mean, let me tell you, let me ask you this. If, if Emily and Mike uh, told you that they could visit you as long as you didn't try to talk them out of Scientology, is that something that you could do? Wow, that's a tough one. Oh, my God. Um, you know, the thing is, if I look back at when they were in, when we did have contact with them, you know, people who, who sort of don't speak out and sort of stay quiet so they can see their kids, when their kids are in the Sea Org, it's not real contact. They might phone up and say, oh, everything's fine. There's no real communication. There's no real, and, and I, even if they said that, they're not going to come and visit. Yeah. I lived in Florida in 20 years. Emily might have been there on some Scientology business, and she'd stop by for 10 minutes to see us. But any other time we saw them, we would have to go there. And at, at most, we would see them. I think Emily, we got her to get away for half a day, but it was uh, there were some things we suspect that she had her her cell phone on or recording us or whatever. Just the way, anyway. Uh, uh, and also, we uh, anyway. That's fine. And then um, with Michael, it was well. Actually, we did get Michael and his wife uh, up to like a little family reunion once. Mm. Uh, while we were still in, um, we uh, we were complaining so much about them that they never got away and they never did family and family, family, family. And um, so uh, we paid for flight and everything and flew them up to Winnipeg where we met. And uh, uh, Emily was going to come too. Her flight was all paid. And last minute she calls you, oh, no, I have to go into a project. Sorry, I can't make it. They just would not let her go. Hmm. Um, but we spent a week with uh, Michael, which was really nice. Uh, and that's when you were still in Scientology. Uh, well, enough in that we weren't at what, yeah, we were in enough in our heads still at the time that we weren't going to be trying to get him out. Um, I did get to see him, and I did say, if, you know, when he when they were setting up that tent for you know, remember when they did the IAS event in Florida? Yes. And they set up that tent. Well, I was going down to see him every day, bringing him his Starbucks coffee. I think that was 2013. Right. And we were under the radar at the time, but we were out in our heads. And we I was sort of dropping these hints and tell, told him that I, I think I actually even told him that we're not really doing any more Scientology. And he said to me, he said, do you think it's the tech or the people? Oh, wow. And I said, if the tech worked, you wouldn't have bad people. And, you know, and and then and then uh, one day, Willie and I both went down. And I think this is the last day that he was there. And we told him, we said, we will never disconnect from you, no matter what. Because we, we, we knew it was going to prob possibly come up in the future, because we were we were out and it was pretty uh, dicey how things were at the time because there was a lot of people turning a lot of people in back then in the early uh, it, around the two twelve two thirteen times and stuff, um, and um, you know Willie gave him a big hug and he just hung on for dear life and. Uh, and I think that was the last we actually saw him. So almost a decade. Yeah. Well, the two of you have been through so much, and then to be involved in this TV show for a year and go through that emotional roller coaster, it's just such a shame that it just hasn't been released in any form. Well, 
I still hold out hope. You know, Scientology is shrinking. Uh, you know, here in Canada, at least in Ontario, there is really not much left in, of Scientology here at all. And I, you know, I keep hearing other orgs are the same. Um, I, I'm, I know that, you know, every five years, ten years, people are saying, oh, yeah, this is the end. <laughs> I don't think it's the end of Scientology, but I'm just hoping it shrinks far enough that our kids wake up. I don't want them to be the last two out the door. Well, I think it's really suggestive that Mike said that, is it the tech or the people? Because that that suggests there might be a glimmer in there that he realizes that things are not working. And uh, and, and, and just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, that's what Bruce Hines told me was his first crack in the in the in this bubble was that he started to realize that that things are not working the way they're supposed to. Now he said at that point he was still fully, you know, a Hubbard kind of thinking person, but just the fact that it, things right. weren't working correctly was enough to begin with the doubt. And if right. Mike said that, Didn't it suggests he was still in for fourteen years after that, though. No, maybe. <laughs> I'm no. trying to get. I'm trying to give you a glimmer of hope oh, here, Phil. But you know what? It, it's true though. My first glimmer of hope was years ago. It was like. Um, I, when I first realized they were lying at events, when when the Canadians were down at Flag for a, a big event at Ruth Eckert Hall, and all the Canadians were sitting had flown down and sitting together, they were going to be acknowledged for something about CCHR having shut down all the psychiatric hospitals on Ontario, Canada. So they wanted me to sit with them. So I said, well, what happened? And so I talked to the girl that I talked to was actually one of the people who is a convicted uh, Snow White. Uh, one in the Canadian one, she was one of the ones that actually got convicted of the crime uh, for the Snow Scientology, Scientology spying scandals of the right. late '70s right. and early '80s. Yes. So I asked her. I said, "Well, what are we all standing up for?" And she said, "Well, so and so uh, was had done that." So, well, well, tell me exactly what he did. Well, he hasn't done it yet, but he's got some appointments. I thought, well, if he hasn't done anything, why are you getting acknowledged? Well, you know, they need stuff at events to to you know, pump people up. And I said, well, I'm not going to sit with you for that because it's nothing has been done. So I went back and sat over on the other, far side of the auditorium with Willie and didn't sit with them. But I, I started at that point, I realized what I'm hearing at events is not true. It, it's mostly just all a pack of lies. And that was my first little kind of opening. I think that was I don't know when that was a probably mid to late 90s so I mean I was still in for a number of years after that but uh, but it, it took you know quite a few sort of chinks of you know yeah. information filtering through to kind of break through well uh, I know you haven't given up hope I have hope uh, I, I, I just I, I think that at some point um, conditions are going to change and your kids are going to have a chance to think things straight. I wish the Sirens Media show had been one of those things that might have yeah. broken through and it's a shame that it uh, uh, didn't get out. Yeah, I kind of wish that even if they threw it up on YouTube or something, you know, um, something. I, uh, I, and, or I, I, I wouldn't mind even at some point just seeing the show. I mean, it's from quite a few years ago now and I'm, you know, I'll probably sort of uh, winch at some of the things we said and did and that you know we got pretty emotional at times during the show um, you know uh, it was it was not an easy thing to film and talk about the kids all the time but uh, I still would like to see it but I, I don't know if I'll ever get the chance well listen thank you for talking to me about it so that our readers can listeners can Maybe, you know, get some sense of what it was like. And uh, who knows? Maybe someday it'll get leaked to us the way Brian Seymour's series oh, was leaked. That's right. you know? Yeah, who knows? Maybe it will. But anyway, I, I really appreciate you doing this. I, I appreciate all the, the press you put out there and all the reporting. Uh, and I'm honored to be in the bunker. And I just hope you don't make me take the stairs all the way back to the surface. <laughs> okay, Phil. Thank you so much for coming down inside the Earth's crust to talk with me. And I uh, look forward to the next thing you write for the bunker. Right. Thank you very much. Phil. Thanks, Tony, very much.